The, uh, our speaker tonight is uh, Kastutis Paulus Gigas. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at Arizona State University in Tempe, Tempe, Arizona. He has a, a great educational pedigree, Harvard, uh, PhD Cornell, and very many uh, awards to his name. Uh, I've known him over the years, off and on. He is also, by the way, the consul, uh, the honorary consul of the Republic of Lithuania for Arizona, and uh, has been active in Lithuanian affairs for a very long time. Um, he has published uh, already on this topic. Uh, those of you who have been to the cathedral in Vilnius and have walked in and then gone to the right side and observed that absolutely gorgeous Baroque chapel of St. Casimir, uh, will be very interested in, in what he says about the history. Uh, and although he has published about this before, perhaps we shall see tonight some uh, new insights into the history of that structure. As you know, Vilnius is a city well known for its Baroque architecture and, uh, and, and its beauty. So I, without further ado, I would ask Professor Gigas to take the stand. Everyone hear me? <clears throat> In the back? Okay. <clears throat> oh, all right. There we go. All right. There we go. All righty. Uh, first, the big picture. Uh, <clears throat> you've probably heard of Lithuania, biggest country in Europe, stretched from the Baltic to the Black Sea. The problem is people listening to that are not quite sure what you're talking about because they have no clue where the Baltic Sea is, where the Black Sea is, or where the Caspian Sea is. So here's something better for you. It was the biggest, part of the biggest state in Europe, the Commonwealth of Two Nations, or the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, as the Poles like to say, it was the largest state in Europe in 1620, larger than France and Spain combined almost a million square kilometers. So, hey guys, when the, when the pilgrims are setting up shop in Plymouth in 1620, uh, we're doing some remarkable things in, in Vilnius and in Lithuania. Uh, the Commonwealth's total population is nine million, which is about the size of Philip II's Spain. The four million part in, uh, in, the, in the Commonwealth, of the common Lithuanian part, was about the size of the of, uh, population of England under Elizabeth I and Shakespeare. Now, when Lithuania was kind of regaining its independence in the 1990s, you would hear people in the State Department kind of saying, well, you know, what political schmarts can a country of three million have? You know, man. Well, how many colonists were there in 1776? Pick a number. About three million. <laughs> so, yeah, so they produced, we had signers of the, of the Declaration of Independence, Ben Franklin, George Washington, John Quincy Adams, on and on. Three million people can do a lot and can have lots of schmatters. Okay, so. This is the original context. This is Vilnius. Uh, when it was being built, it was, a chapel was built in the 1620s and 1630s. And Vilnius at that time is essentially a Gothic city. And it is Renaissance Baroque. So it's, it's an architectural uh, kind of a architectural novelty in its day. So it's right next to the Cathedral of Vilnius. And then we have the upper castle, the lower castle, Voldovo Rume, and so on. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, and it does not stand out from the cathedral. It's sort of, uh, sort of same language. But originally, this was all uh, Gothic except for the, except for the um, chapel. This is what the original probably looked like something like this. The altar is black ebony with silver statues 
God the Father at the top, Saints uh, Peter and Paul, second register down, King Sigismund Vasa and Saint Casimir, Prince Casimir down below, and then we have his sarcophagus. The statues that, these statues were added a century later. Note, very calm color scheme. We have the oxblood pilasters, and then we have black. So it's a very, very subdued color scheme. Guess how much it cost? It was estimated, uh, like I think 30, 40 years after it was completed, that if you took the cost of the, of the building, all the accoutrements, the statues, uh, there was a golden chandelier hanging up there, and another chandelier with 63 candles. Uh, you put them all together, uh, all the gifts, three million gold ducats. Three million gold ducats, which includes, if you, it wasn't built, uh, used gold all the time because you also use silver, but when you convert all the silver into one, uh, uh, one form of, uh, of currency, converted to gold, three million gold ducats. This is a gold ducat minted in Vilnius. And you said, see the date up there, 1548? 1548. So that's uh, half a century after Columbus sailed the ocean blue and was messing around in the Caribbean. This was minted in, in Vilnius. Here's uh, 50 years later, this is the uh, uh, Stephen Bathory issued uh, this gold coin and among others. And you can see the date up there someplace, or maybe not. Here we go, 1586. Moneta Aurea Lit Magnus Ducatus Lithuania. And here is Sigismund III. This is one of the guys who paid for it. Uh, and this is some more. And you can look at the dates 1664. Here's some more, 1665. Uh, so it's been, the mint was active and they were issuing gold coinage. So Smithsonian has some, but they're not on display. So I went there, made an appointment to see them, had about half a dozen of them. And they, uh, they're about the, the thinness of a dime. You know, they're about the size of a five cent piece, but thin, thin pieces. And if you take the weight, because all the weights were known and you convert it into uh, current dollars and cents, the, the ratio of a gold to the dollar changes all the time, but the last time I checked, it would have cost, in today's money, hold on ladies and gentlemen, $250 million. $250 million. That is one hell of a unlimited budget that you have, I mean, you know. You can do anything you damn well please, uh, and they did, and they did. Um, uh, so money was no object. I have no idea where the money came from, but of the population in the uh, Grand Duchy of Lithuania at that time, most were Slavs, most were Orthodox. So of course they weren't contributing. However, they did go to bars and taverns. So whether they wanted to or not, the good people in Belarus and Ukraine were also paying for it, whether they knew it or not. So money you know, came from a variety of sources. I, I've got to read more about this, sort of uh, where the money came from. Now, here we go. So an example of that are the sorts of things that bishops uh, bring with them when they uh, become formally um, um, blessed, I guess, as bishops, and they typically bring chalices like this. This is the uh, two items of uh, George Radvila. Here is an exhibition of some of the other chalices contributed, uh, donated to the to the uh, Vilnius Cathedral. And then we've got this incredible three-foot-high monstrance of gold donated by Gorstautas. So these bishops had 
disposable income. They were wealthy enough to uh, give gifts like this to the, um, to the cathedral. You can see these items if you, if you go to the um, Church Treasury Museum, Bajniti no Pavel do Museus in Vilnius. How many of you have been there? Just two or three. It's a world-class museum. No idea, it's just filled with all sorts of incredible uh, instruments like this, and the side room has some of the vestments that are used, and more vestments are on display up in the balcony. Absolutely not to be missed, so this has to be the first thing on your bucket list when you go to, uh, when you go to Vilnius. So, uh, here is a picture painted in the 1580s of, of uh, Prince Casimir. And um, uh, here is his brother. Now, Prince Casimir dies in Vilnius. He is in, uh, interred in the, in the chapel, the St. Mary's Chapel. And people start coming to, um, to his tomb and praying and, <coughs> excuse me, a number of people are cured through God's grace, and the word spreads, and a cult develops in, um, in Vilnius. <coughs> so, his brother and um, <coughs> the bishop of Vilnius at the time, whose picture I don't have, um, go to Rome, and they have to make a kind of a um, obedience to the Holy See. Uh, they do that, and there's also a presentation uh, of what's happening in Vilnius, and they mention that uh, there is a, a cult of, of growing of the Prince Casimir, and this is Alexander I who receives the information, and in a few months he uh, issues approval uh, for anyone praying there under certain conditions would be granted indulgences. This is Pope Alexander VI, Borgia, one of the most hated popes in, uh, of the papacy. A positive biography of Pope Alexander VI has not yet been written in 500 years. He must have done some good things, but people, uh, a papacy knew better. Uh, the succeeding popes refused to, uh, to live in his apartments. He had one mistress, uh, fathered four children, and when he, when he died, nobody wanted to go to his funeral. So three or four lower rank clergy were told to go to his funeral for heaven's sake. When uh, he was time to bury him, uh, his body had started to rot prematurely. So it was believed that, that he was poisoned. Uh, this sort of thing happened in the Renaissance, left and right, no big deal, you know, so. Anyway, Pope Paul VI. Now, this is um, Bishop of uh, Vilnius a couple of years later, and this is his other brother. And they decide, you know, we gotta do something about this. So they send a petition to, oops, Pope Leo X. Pope Leo X asking, you know, we, we'd like to start the canonization process. Uh, and uh, he agrees, he forms a commission. There's a process, you form a commission. He forms a commission of three bishops. Uh, one of them is uh, one in Vilnius, Bishop Jonas. And then there's Ferreri, and I don't have a picture of the third guy. And each of the bishops conducts their own inquiries and make their own report. So they don't write a common report. You have three different people doing their inquiries and uh, they submit it to the Sacred Congregation of Rites. Now, for one reason or, an er uh, or another, uh, Bishop uh, Ferreri was in a hurry and he issued a biography. Before going back to Rome, uh, he has submitted the report. The report is one thing, but he writes a biography, which is this uh, Vita Beate Casimiri Confessoris, 
And uh, it's a good thing that he did because the 1527 sack of Rome destroys oodles and oodles of documents and archives. And the reports about Prince Casimir conducted by the three bishops, gone. Not a trace of them left. So what we know, the great majority comes from that first biography by uh, Bishop Ferreri. Uh, Rome is in turmoil. There you see him up in Castle San Angelo, up at the top. And here we have um, another view. And uh, the person being carried is not the Pope, it's somebody impersonating him, and they're all dressed in um, various garments that they have, um, you know, robbed from, from uh, church properties. So it, um, it is just a disaster. Um, uh, people could not imagine that anything like this could possibly happen. Um, and the population of Rome really, really falls dramatically. Now, the Catholic Protestant uh, differences um, climax in a Bildersturm, in, in the German word, which is sort of picture destruction where we have the uh, Catholic uh, churches in uh, Protestant countries are absolutely vandalized. So you see the stained glass windows on the right being smashed. You have statues being pulled down. Uh, you have uh, people opening sarcophagi and, and uh, coffins. And here, running, running away with some goodies over here and over there. So we have this going on in uh, most of the major cities of Europe. We had problems in Vilnius as well. Now, after the storm subsides, this is what Protestant churches, the insides look like. They're essentially white. And to this day, if you go to Protestant churches in New England, uh, in Holland, Germany, they're essentially white. And this is the way Catholic churches also looked from the 1550s to the 1600s. Uh, St. Peter's interior was white at that time. You have in Venice, San Giorgio, and Redentore, they're all white. Il Gesù uh, in Rome was white, the interior was white. The Nuova Chiesa of Oratorians was also white. That they got decorated in the 17th century is another issue altogether, but uh, it seemed that church interiors would be as white as we see over here. Now, Council of Trent is called. It lasts a number of sessions. If you think sign of, uh, present sign would take too long, this kind of last 25 years. It was, it was called to sort of review what was going on in the Catholic Church to uh, sort of um, take a stand against the Protestant Reformation, do all sorts sort of uh, discipline things, uh, clarify doctrinal manners, on and on and on. So this is kind of uh, sets the sets the basis for what is going to happen because uh, Carlo Borromeo, he's a bishop at the time, later he, uh, then he becomes a cardinal and later on he actually canonized. He addresses the arts. He addresses the arts in the way that the Trent, Council of Trent did not. The, uh, the Council of Trent said you should look to the examples of of uh, apostolic traditions. The problem is apostolic traditions are over within a century of the last apostles. That in the first church doesn't get built for another quarter of a century when Christianity is, um, is, 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 uh, is legalized. So he issues a book about instruction of decoration of churches. And there he says a number of interesting things. He says, you know, decoration is fine. You can spend as much as you want, uh, and uh, he is actually picking up on ideas of Aristotle that St. Thomas approved, uh, St. Ambrose approved, uh, and then we have, uh, uh, I forget the other saints, uh, 
who also said it's okay, even though we have other saints who said no, uh, churches should be austere. But if you look at this, this is, this is one of the chapels in uh, Santa Maria Maggiore, and you just love amazed at this is what's happening here. Where are all the marbles coming from? What does this thing cause? How do you justify this? People were just blown away when they visited this. Even the Protestants were just blown and they just couldn't get over just the expense of these Catholic churches. Um, this is a, uh, in Santa Pudenciana where uh, Cardinal Radvila was supposed to be interred, uh, but he's interred in El Gesu. He was a good friend of the cardinal who was interred there. So, but also look at this is a, a cardinal's chapel. It's rather, well, it's a little less ornate, exuberant than what we looked at a minute ago, but it still is just over the top. Uh, let me go back. I'm missing an image. Then there was, anyway. Here is uh, where uh, Cardinal Radvila would have, could have been, might have been interred, but he ended up in El Gezu. Now, the Council of Trent did a number of reforms like the Gregorian calendar, but they also issued a booklet, a book called Martyrologium Romanum, the Roman, it's a sort of a list of all the Roman Catholics, uh, saints, uh, that are out there. So at the time they gathered every, every bit of material that was available uh, and they uh, looked and they got a hold of Ferreri's book and they noticed that Ferreri's biography had prayers and hymns uh, included in there which is typically only done when the Pope had approved the canonization. Uh, this was gung-ho, Ferreri did it on his own initiative. But the uh, people who did the, uh, the martyrologium said, hey, this was approved by Pope Leo, it must be okay. When this book is translated into Polish, the people there and in Vienna say, wait a minute, wait a minute, there is a problem. Uh, it's issued like 1578, 1580 or something. It says, no, 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 this is a problem. He wasn't done properly. Now, 1590s, Radvila, Jurgis Radvila, is a bishop of Vilnius. He is named the Cardinal. He's very, very popular in the Vatican. And they, uh, he's even papabile, capable of being elected the Pope conclave of 1592. Um, but it isn't, uh, and a number of reasons, his young, his health. But the biggest obstacle is that most of his relatives are Calvinists and they th thought that the Calvinist relatives could affect his decision. So um, this is a um, you know, interesting, uh, interesting thing to know about him. Among other things, he does such a good job, they want him to permanently reside in Rome and then say we can't, so he is appointed Bishop of Krakow. Bishop of Krakow, and after 10 years in Vilnius, had he continued in Vilnius, he would have fixed the Prince Casimir's canonization process to the end, but he's in Krakow, he can't do much about it. The Poles did not want him. The reason is he's uh, Lithuanian. What's wrong with that? Well, the Bishop of Krakow is the only person who can crown a king of Poland. So you have a Lithuanian crowning the king of Poland, and the Poles want none of it. You know, so. But anyway, he, the Pope appoints him Bishop of Krakow. He remains there until he, until he dies. So when you go to El Gizu and you find his, uh, uh, his, his, his tomb, uh, it's uh, entered on the floor, it'll, it'll talk about Krakow. It'll not mention anything about, about Vilnius. Ah, uh, this is the sort of thing that the architect uh, Constante Tenkala was the um, stone cutter, mason, uh, builder of St. Uh, Casimir Chapel. This is the sort of thing that his uncle was doing in Rome before he ended up in Krakow. And you notice the, the profusion of light colored marbles that are there. Now, the, this is Bishop Voina in Vilnius, who decides to do something about it, to renew that canonization process, get it right, 
And he, and, uh, he writes a letter uh, together with the king, and they write a letter to Clement VIII, uh, which is a picture over here, but I prefer this one. He is the one who made coffee legal for Christians. Yes, hallelujah. He said, why should infidels, he, you know, cardinals were against it. He, he said, why should in, infidels have monopoly on this great beverage? <laughs> the other thing is, what were they otherwise be drinking? Beer and wine. And you drink enough of those, you become stupid and silly, you know. You drink coffee, you become sharp, smart, and so on. So he okays it, and the first Starbucks opens in Rome in 1645. Okay? Yeah, so he's the one who okays the veneration of Casimir in Vilnius. Um, but it's only within the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So the veneration is restricted. Now, this is the king at the time uh, who uh, writes to him. And then this bishop, Evstakus Valavich, has come along and the people in Vilnius, they're not happy with it. They want worldwide recognition of St. Casimir's saintliness, which is not there. So uh, he goes to Vilnius, and uh, Pope Paul V Borghese approves it. Uh, various, you know, they first submit the application to the Sacred Congregation of Rights, and he approves it, and after that, uh, we have the veneration of Casimir it goes into the breviaries and the missals of the Roman Catholic Church throughout the world. Now, so they can, uh, in Vilnius, so St. Casimir's chapel is built as a result of that 1621 broadening of the canonization. And so they say, okay, we got this thing, uh, the king is behind us, we got all kinds of money to spend, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? On what should it be based? And the crucial image is in front of you. And it says the oracle was 20 cubits in length, 20 cubits breadth, 20 cubits height. It's a cube of 20 cubits. And he overlaid it with most pure gold. <coughs> and the altar he covered with cedar. This is Solomon's temple, holy of holies. A cubit is this dimension from here to there. And the problem is that it could be measured in various ways. Uh, more about that later. So the decision is made, okay, we're going to have a, <coughs> a cubic chapel. And here is a diagram of the elevation. Outside is a, this is, is a square, as is the interior. And what are they doing? Uh, here's a diagram of the uh, one in the Gothic cathedral. Here's in the, in the 19th century cathedral. We have a cubic interior. What's the Holy of Holies for? It all starts with Solomon. He received the Decalogue, the Ten Commandment tablets on Mount Sinai, and he created the Ark of the Covenant for it. And he is, this is Solomon, and he is preparing the tabernacle, which is this building over here, over here to receive the Holy of Holies. So you have the Holy of Holies, you have the tabernacle. This is Solomon, uh, sorry, this is Moses. And in this particular case, it's a temporary structure. It's supposed to take it down because remember, they were wandering in the desert for 40 years, right? Here's what the tabernacle, a recreation of the tabernacle. It's wonderful, wonderful descriptions in the Bible. And of course, how many of you have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? One, two, three. Most of you have lots of homework. Lots of homework. Check it out. It's a, it's a wonderful adventure. This is what the Ark of the Covenant has been recreated. Uh, it was actually probably stolen, destroyed by the Egyptians 30 years after, after Solomon's death, but anyway. So here's what happens. This is the Solomon's temple, 
and uh, another recreation, another model of it. And the Holy of Holies is that tall building inside that tall building in the back. And then it's also, if you sort of, Solomon's Temple gets destroyed, gets rebuilt, destroyed, rebuilt, but each one has a Holy of Holies, and all the Holy of Holies through the centuries are 20 cubits. Uh, because, of, because this is the description of the Holy of Holies in, in, uh, in the Bible. This is Philip II's Escorial, largest Renaissance building in, in Europe, and it's based on a module of 20, 20 uh, cubits, and you can see that module up front. Um, this guy and all, all the riches of the New World there, and you have two statue groups, one of uh, Philip II and Charles V, uh, gilt silver statues, they're still there to, uh, to this day. Uh, now, we move to Florence, and we move to this little building there, A. It's Brunelleschi's old chapel. And guess what? The dimensions are 20 cubits. It's very, very influential in the early Renaissance. We're talking 15th century. And there's dozens and dozens of churches and chapels built uh, on that 20, uh, following the Brunelleschi's chapel. B is the Medici chapel, also follows it. This is what the old chapel looks like. Here's the 20 cubit grid on it. And if you look to the plan of, um, of the uh, interior, you, this, the meters, if they're converted into braccia, uh, Florentine braccia, you get 20 of them. And if you look at the dimensions of Casimir's Chapel in Vilna, if you convert from meters into Florentine braccia, you get about 20 braccia. Uh, now, the thing about the cube, it's all fine. This is, this is uh, you know, Solomon. Uh, but the cube as such, it doesn't, it's nothing particularly Christian about it. It's biblical, this is wonderful. So what they did uh, with Medici Chapel that you see in front of you did is to protrude some of the sides a little bit and they made a reduced Greek cross. So if you look at it, this is not a cube like the old chap, but it's a reduced Greek cross. And once you fill it up with, with statues, you kind of really don't notice it. But if you take the dimensions, uh, what's behind there, you get 20 Florentine braccia. And the way that was generated, if you take a 20 cubit uh, 20 cu cubit branches square, put on a circle of the same area, you do this transformation, and the plan that you have on the left is the plan of the Medici Chapel in the middle, and that's the plan of St. Casimir's Chapel on the right. So we have a beautiful connection to Vitruvius and reduced Greek cross chapels in, uh, in Vilnius. Um, an air view of the Medici Chapel, you see the reduced Greek cross. If you follow the outline at the entablature level, and if you look into the ceiling of the St. Casimir's Chapel, you also see it. Now, this guy, so we have the basic dimensions, we have the plan of the chapel. The question is, how do we furnish it? What materials do you use? Uh, and guess what? Materials, colors also have baggage associated with them. So this says, uh, Nicholas Christopher Radzville, Dux Olica and Nesvigius, and then S.R. Imperio, Imperial Prince of the Holy Roman Empire. This guy is big deal. Palatine of Vilnius. He is the Radzivils were princes of the Holy Roman Empire. Big, big, very, very important figures. He decides he's going to make a pilgrimage to, to the Holy Land, uh, and he is uh, doing it out of genuine piety. But there's also, he has a head wound that he thanks the Lord for not being killed outright. This was in a, in a, in a battle uh, against the Muscovites. He was there supporting King Stephen Botnery, 
So he thanks the Lord for that. And he's also seeking a cure from, as he puts it, from the follies of his youth. What are the follies of his youth? I'm not going to put it into words, but you can figure it out. So he goes to all kinds of spas, and he is, eventually, he is cured from the follies of his youth. When he returns to home, he marries a 15-year-old gal. He's not taking any chances, and they have a very happy marriage. There's six or seven kids, you know. So anyway, Radvila, there we go. This is the Latin edition as it came out in, uh, in several Polish editions, uh, German editions, Russian edition, Lithuanian edition. Kelioni i Jerusalem. It reads like a, a Hollywood action film. I mean, they, could, they can put Raiders of the Lost Ark to shame with this guy. This is for real. It really is. So he's traveling to Jerusalem by uh, way of the uh, he took the sea journey rather than uh, taking, uh, going through Constantinople. He visits the pyramids, is uh, always meeting with brigands. He isn't traveling alone. He's a sort of a group party uh, traveling with them. And this is one of the gates that, uh, that he enters into Jerusalem. He's traveling by, by camel. The country, remember, is ruled by Muslims. It's not Catholic. It's not Christian and they control everything, and they don't like the uh, Christians particularly because there's a, memories of the Crusades are not very fondly remembered in the Holy Land. So this is the Church of the Holy Sepulcher as he would have seen it. It's those two doors there. Now, uh, this is where the tomb of Christ is located, Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. We all recognize the figure. This is St. Francis. And 800 years ago, he goes, and he, he goes to Egypt, to, and he meets the sultan there. Uh, and he wants a better treatment of the Christians uh, in, the, in the Holy Land, among other things. Um, and the sultan says, essentially, all right, all right, yeah, what do you got? You know, this kind of stuff. And the Franciscans, get what is known as the become what's known as the custodians of the Holy Land. They are in charge of taking care of all the holy sites in the Holy Land, and that ex exists to this day. So they acquire most of the of the of the important shrines there, and they take care of them. They take care of pilgrims, and when Razvil goes to Jerusalem, he's met by the. Um, by the custodian there, they take him in, they show him around, and uh, uh, this is what you would see there today. He, uh, he visits the Church of the Holy Sepulchre three different times. He stays there the entire night because that is the routine. Uh, this is what it looked like one day during the, uh, during the COVID epidemic. The guy on the right has the keys because you're locked in there uh, until, you are, until you are let in. And this is what the Holy Sepulchre looks like today. This is after a fire in the 19th century. This is what it looked like when Radvila visited. It was much smaller. Uh, it's open uh, under the open dome. And uh, Radvila describes it. And very interesting for us, he says, you know, these columns on the outside of the sepulchre are made out of porphyry. Porphyry. Okay, very interesting. And then the Franciscans even give a little piece from a broken porphyry column up in Mount Zion, um, and they give it to him, uh, and, which they would give to various visitors uh, to sort of uh, remember us and do some fundraising for us, and he becomes, I think, a, he a, a, becomes officially um, a, a sort of a defender of the sepulcher. I forget the exact wording of the shrine. And guess what? Oh, this is a, what we have. This is where the sepulcher is. This used to be the rock hillside. And the sultan back in the fourth century hated the Christians so much, he had this, all this hacked away. 
all this was hacked away. So you get this freestanding building, which is all that remains of the tomb. Had he kept on going, we would not have the, uh, the tomb today. So that's what, what he visits. And this is Radvila. He takes along his, his gifts. He takes a, a chalice and a patent to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and also to the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. And guess what? Of the four gifts, two of them survived. The ones in the Church of the, Holy, uh, of the Nativity survived. They're exhibited in Vilnius, uh, this golden uh, pa patent and chalice. This is, uh, here it is. Couldn't get a larger picture of it. So this is the chalice that he brought all the way from Vilnius to the Holy Land back in 1570s, 1580s. Just amazing. So here we see, this is an illustration from the book, uh, Latin, a Journey to um, Jerusalem, and we see the Holy Sepulcher over here. That's the entire building. These are the porphyry columns I was talking about. This is the actual sepulcher. Uh, this is the uh, entrance, and that, there's the actual remains in the rock cut tomb. The Franciscans have their own uh, chapel. Uh, oops. Franciscans have their own chapel. It is uh, over here someplace. Okay, so here is a Bishop Valavichus in Vilnius is reading it, and it says the pilasters, columns for the church of the, uh, of the actual tomb are out of porphyry. Okay, and visitors coming to Vilnius to the chapel, they, they look at the interior at one visitor, says, you know, they have porphyry pilasters, uh, among other things. And where does the idea for having this particular type of marble come from? Well, it's in that particular book, because why do you use this type of color? Because that's what's used on the tomb of Christ. It's not porphyry, it is uh, rouge de rance, it's a type of marble imported from Belgium. So the bishops had to import marble from Belgium because porphyry has not been available since the fourth century. It's not available for a thousand years. So they get a color that's as close as possible to it. I mean, they could have used white marble. They could have used blue marble. They could have used orange. But no, they had to have ox blood. Why? Because it resembles porphyry. So that explains why we have the... Now the other thing is the black, black walls. Where in heaven did the black walls come from? And this was really problematic for me. I, I couldn't get any, there aren't that many black marble chapels out there, period. As the, as the color is associated with funeral, but I show you what some of the marble chapels are like in Rome, there's nothing like it. You know, so the popes aren't doing it, the cardinals aren't doing it. Nobody's doing it. So you kind of wonder what the precedent might be. This is Einzied in, in, in uh, Switzerland, and there's this little church, and the, the architect of St. Casimir's Chapel probably knew this guy, probably worked with him. Constante Tencala worked on St. Peter's Basilica. We also have black marble uh, chapels in, in Krakow, but this is like 30, uh, this is in the Vavel Cathedral, the Vasa, but this is about 30 years after St. Casimir's Chapel. And the St. Casimir's Chapel, the black marble, this is another view of that Vasa. So the black marble that they used in the, um, in St. Casimir's also imported from Belgium. And to import marble from Bel tons and tons of it, you had to get the permission of the Spanish king to do that. And this was done, they had to, had to do it right, um, because the black marble that you could get in Poland turned gray after a while. So they wanted the highest quality possible black marble. You can only get this in Flanders Valley, period. This is the great chapel of the princes in Florence, next to San, 
San Lorenzo, and let's see. Yeah, it's this big one, C. It talked about A and it talked about B. The Medici Chapel C is the chapel of the princes. And this was supposed to be another mausoleum for the Medici Dukes. It's unfinished, but the idea was that its interior was going to be covered in black marble. And this was being discussed when Bishop Olavichus and uh, was kind of traveling in, in, uh, in Florence. Uh, so this was in the air, but it was never done because it was too damn expensive. The black marble was very, very expensive, not enough of it available in Italy. This is so huge and it's empty. Why? The Medici had the idea that they were going to go to Jerusalem and hack the tomb of Christ from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and bring it to Florence and reconstruct it over here. St. Peter's, ha, forget it. We are going to have something much more important than the tomb of a mere apostle and have the real thing. Well, it didn't come to pass. The people that were going to do the, the, the uh, deconstruction of the tomb of Christ they were kind of stopped, so they escaped and uh, this remains as empty as it is. So when you're in Florence, uh, that's the reason why it's empty. Yeah, it's huge, huge building. So. Now, why the idea of black marble? So one possible choice, I thought, you had cabinets like this were being produced in Florence, uh, and they're kind of miniature architectural models uh, with beautiful inlays. Or you also had house altars made out of ebony like this. This one belonged to the Vasas. So I thought this is another one. Then this is a model of interior, one of the Cosimo Dukes praying inside a black marble chapel. You have uh, the Cathedral of Florence in the windows. It's black marble. So I thought maybe this is another thing. And then the other thing, turned out that black was the color of the age. It all started Philip the Good, 15th century. I'm sure he was not as thin as portrayed here. This was a time of Vitotas um, Magnus. And what this guy did, he popularized black in court. Why black? It was the most expensive material that you could possibly get because a black dye that would hold was very, very expensive. Whether it's wool, whether it's silk, whether it's satin. So if you were wearing something that is black, you've got, you've got deep pockets to afford that kind of stuff. So he popularized this and this becomes very, very important. Uh, uh, this is the sort of recreation of what he was wearing. And this becomes very important. This is Charles V, the most powerful man in Europe in his day, followed by this guy, also the most important man in Europe in his time, Philip II. And then you also have uh, Baldassare Castiglione advising people if you want to be uh, sober, uh, dress like the Spanish dress, and they dress in black. So his very, very uh, book about the uh, Il Cortegiano, what a proper courtier should, we should wear. And of course, when you see the, the, what these guys are doing, and this is not day wear, they're showing you that they are dressed in black, which is, you know, the court is, is you know, if, if you're wealthy, if you're powerful, this is how you dress. And question, yeah. The lady here is, this is a movie, film, and we're looking at Lucretia Borgia, one of Pope Alexander VI's children. This is on her wedding day. And what is she wearing? A black gown. A black gown. All the ladies there are also wearing black because it's the most prestigious material, the most prestigious color that you can possibly use. And uh, the stage is set. So, uh, this lady is not dressed in black for a funeral. This lady is not dressed in black for a funeral. This lady is not dressed in black for a funeral. And these ladies are not you know, gussied up to go to funerals. The thing about black is it's good contrast to just about any other color. So 
tell your sweethearts or your significant others you want one of each, you know. To hell with devil wears Prada, you know. This is a way to go. So the fashion starts in the 15th century. It's going to this day. It's still strong because of the innate property of black. So I thought black was chosen for uh, Casimir's Chapel because da 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 because it would offset the uh, the pilasters. Uh, here is uh, Philip II. He's imitating. Sorry, he's imitating Philip II. This is Sigismund III, one of the guys who paid for Casimir's Chapel. Here is. His uh, next king, he's also wearing black. They're wearing the golden fleece, an honorary uh, order of, uh, from Spain. And, and I said, you know, but you're not going to cover a chapel in a particular color because it's popular at the time. It, it, may, be, it may be popular, but that's not reason enough. And then it finally hits me. The tabernacle of Moses was made out of acacia. It's a wood that turns black over time. And he is instructed to use black because it's an indestructible material. The Egyptians made boats out of it. They made coffins out of it. The Septuagint Bible mentions acacia. Uh, so that is the material to use. And the Lord also says, the fittings of that that we are looking at, we're talking at, about this stuff here, this stuff there, over there, over there. They're going to be out of silver and gold, black silver and gold. And what we see in the chapel of St. Casimir, black silver and gold. So the color and the accoutrements, they go back to, to Moses and to Solomon. And Guess what? What material is the Ark of the Covenant made from? Acacia, covered with gold. So the whole thing, black with gold, way back, very, very credible, important combination. Now, this is St. Peter's, of course, and we are looking at some bishops being, uh, receiving their, uh, the sacraments. Uh, here and now, there is a cut there, it's called the Confessio. Uh, the architect Tancala worked on the balustrade over there. And you see here, we have multiple floors. That's the present floor level. Originally, that, that, you know, but they raised the floor level, so we have the Confessio level, and then we have the original Roman necropolis down below. Uh, and guess what, Vatican Grottoes. Look at number six. This is prime real estate in St. Peter's and Lithuanians have a chapel. This has occurred after the Second World War. Um, fascinating story. And we are right next to number one and number two, the tomb of St. Peter and the chapel of St. Peter. So when you're in Rome, you should put this on your, on your bucket list. Now, present high altar or the papal altar, the present floor, you come down into the niche of the palia, and if you look at these columns, the column capitals, you look at these particular capitals, and they're unlike any other that, uh, until then, they're your ionic capitals, but they have, but they have these little cherub heads carved in them. And uh, the stone carver mason who, who does um, St. Casimir's Chapel carved these uh, in the entrance to St. Peter's Basilica. So you have the idea for exactly this sort of thing comes from the Confessio, which is above St. Peter's Basilica. It's in the front of St. Entrance to St. Peter's Basilica, and we are talking about these columns over here. So over here, over here, and inside there, they are angels' heads above the Ionic order. Uh, now, up front, 
you have this inscription. It says, it says, what does it say? It says, Paul, the, oops, let's go back, 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 back. It says, Paul the fifth, Paul the fifth, Borghese, Roman, uh, you know, it's just the seventh year of his pontificate. Who is Paul the fifth? Paul the fifth is the Pope who allowed the veneration of Casimir worldwide in 1621. So we have Clement VIII, and then we have Paul the fifth. So this guy allows worldwide veneration. Casimir's name enters all the missiles and breviaries. And his coat of arms is this eagle with outstretched wings. And we see it, this is, uh, there's a capital we were looking at before, over there on the, on the left. Here we see it, and if we look at this is St. Casimir's. What is this eagle? Where is it coming from? Well, it's from the coat of arms of the Pope who allowed the veneration of Casimir worldwide. Where does this particular top of this pilaster come from? That is a direct copy by the same guy who is doing the same kind of things for St. Peter's. Uh, incidentally, these panels originally had scenes from the uh, life of Casimir in silver, which were stripped down, which I will come to in just a second. Uh, and we see, uh, we see those uh, pilaster capitals and we see the eagles there. Uh, this is the loge which connected to the, to the, uh, um, to the ducal palace and, and uh, Sigismund III and none of those who listened to mass from there. So today, uh, this is what we have. This is the scene you're all familiar with. And it's not what you saw before. This is what we have. Vilnius suffered during the so-called deluge. It was occupied by Muscovite troops, 1650s up to 1661. And uh, as they were approaching Bishop Tishkavich's, took the archives, took the relics, um, whatever else he could, so the Muscovite troops would not get any of that. So those things were saved. So the Muscovite troops were still a major, major threat. The uh, Lithuanian army was not prepared, so the Grand Duke of the time said, we have to melt the silver that we can possibly get our hands on. So the silver and gold uh, was uh, requisitioned by the state for to defend the country. So what we had at the time of the original, we had two side altars where those um, uh, murals are today, the side altars, we had all the candlesticks, everything was stripped down, and it came to about 16 tons of silver. 16 tons of silver were taken and melted down. So what we have today has been reinstated afterwards. Louis XIV, Louis XIV also had similar problems equipping his army. He melted down silver furniture, objects that he had. He melted down 40 tons of silver uh, to pay for his war efforts. So what we have is these statues were built like a, for another celebration, totally uh, nothing to do with St. Casimir. Uh, and they were installed 1730s or thereabouts. Everything that we see above here was also built after that deluge. And here we have a stucco, stucco backdrop, but not the ebony and silver that originally was there. So the original that I showed you lasted for about 25 years, and it was all over uh, b before you could say, boo. Uh, this one here, you'll also see the eagle, and that is also referring to Paul V Borghese. Uh, this is the pulpit, gilt pulpit. So what we have is, is, a, is, a, modest, is a modest chapel by comparison to what was being built in Rome. It's, it's very sober, and it's very calm. 
and it's not in your face like the Roman chapel. So it's understated. It's understated, and the whole idea is to, is to generate veneration of the sort of thing that you had in, in apostolic times. Now, this sort of thing goes on, and oops, we are missing. There we go. We're missing. This is recently built in Rio de Janeiro by the Pentecostal community. It's their, it's their recreation of Solomon's temple. The front piece is 18 stories high. It houses 10,000 people. Huge, huge thing. It's opened about five years ago. And the main altar centerpiece, guess what? It's the Ark of the Covenant, recreation of the Ark of the Covenant. So yeah, we, we, we have these um, recreations uh, going over time, but uh, one particular one uh, that we have in Vilnius, they were recalling what was said in the, in the Council of Trent, and he said the things that you do there should reflect the sort of thing that the Christians were doing in biblical and apostolic times. So all of the things that we see there, it's not a question of style, it's not a question of the fads, of what's fashionable, they may help to ease the decision to go for black, but all of the things that we see there can be taken back to their original sources, uh, back, to, back to Solomon, Moses, the apostles, Vitruvius, and then sort of a reduced Greek cross sort of gives it a kind of a, a, a Christian plan. That's it. Thank you, folks. Yes. What type of material is porphyry? Porphyry. Oh my gosh. It's a, it's a volcanic stone found in only one mountain in the middle of the Egyptian desert. It's beautiful. It comes in a number of colors, green, uh, red, but a, a kind of a purple. Purple, and it was preferred material by the Roman emperors and Cleopatra. So they built a special road to get to that mine, and it was worked by convicts, prisoners of war, middle of the desert, uh, to get this. It's very, very hard, and uh, it'd be a good question how they work the damn thing, because it's not like the other marbles. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I need examples of porphyry, but it's all over the place in Rome. Uh, you have sarcophagi, uh, of the Roman emperors in porphyry, uh, also in Constantinople, also you'll find some porphyry there. The mine closed when the Roman, uh, Western Roman Empire collapsed in the fourth century. Nobody's opened it since. So you cannot get it. You can only find reused pieces. You, know, got on any, you can get anything on eBay. I think you probably could get some pieces. You could probably get ashtrays and things like that. So what the popes did is they would use porphyry, which they would pick up from the early Christian and Roman buildings, especially the Roman buildings, because the Romans uh, used porphyry and the, and the popes uh, salvaged it. Salvaged beautiful, beautiful marble from Roman uh, buildings to use in their churches called spolia is uh, what they did. But it, it ain't around anymore. <laughs> yes. Yes. Was St. finally canonized? Because, it, like I heard, it was never canonized as saint. I don't understand the question. Yeah. He is okay. in St. Casper, he's in the sarcophagus. I, I know, which pope did it? Kuris popas, kuris popiežius padarė? Kuris popiežius jį palaido jau? Ne, kuris padarė? Kuris padarė šventuoju? Kanonizavo? Paul V. Borghese. 
1621. 1621. He made the decision a couple of weeks before his death. So, so a, a council was called afterwards to a, a new pope was elected and they reviewed all the decisions that he had made. So he had made, and the second pope okayed it, uh, but he's the one who okayed it to the sacred congregation of rites. So Paul V uh, is the one that should be credited. And it took the whole process, took over a century to, to complete. You mentioned that the chapel was only um, completed and viewed and as it was for 25 years. Yeah. How did, did people write it up? I mean, how, how did anyone know how beautiful it was and, I mean. Well, the ebony altars, if they're made out of wood, it's good firewood. If there's any silver left, we don't believe what these heathen Catholics believed in, so you can scrape whatever you can possibly is left, so you had those panels, would be easy to scrape. So you take whatever goods you can possibly take. When the sack of Rome occurred, if you will notice, what the soldiers were doing, they were robbing the churches left and right, so they would cut their clothes to make places where they could put silver. So you have cuts in their sleeves, over here, they were all filled with, uh, with goodies. It's, it's like bell-bottom pants that are wide because if you're a, if you're a, a gang member, you can hide things in, in wide clothes. So the wide clothes fashion originated the sack of Rome, but they would fill goodies there. So if anything was left that Tishkavichs did not take, the Russian troops uh, took in 1661. And the statues that we see there, Sigismundus, uh, uh, it was a celebration of, of whoever was ruling. Uh, so the statues don't quite fit in, uh, in the niches in which they're placed. And there's very little, there's not enough information what the original intentions were, but there were also two side altars. You know, so they're, they're just filled with goodies. Yes? Um, which, which pope, uh, Blessed the Lithuanian of the Chapel of the Six in the Vatican. Which pope he allowed or blessed the Lithuanian? You don't. Uh, you can build any chapel you damn well want. You don't need papal permission. In, in Saint Peter's, uh, uh, you said there were there were six in Saint Peter's. Yeah. Oh. Oh my God! Uh, this is uh, oh, this is 19, 1970 or something, fifties or something. No, it's, uh, John the twenty third, probable. I wrote an article about that one, and I don't remember which pope it was. I'm sorry, but it, it was it it happened, and I think he uh, it was through efforts of uh, of uh, Catholics in in Rome uh, trying to. Uh, bring his attention to what had happened during the Second World War, but he wanted a rapprochement with Russia. So he uh, was not interested in that initially, but he was convinced to, uh, uh, to let the Lithuanians build that Lithuanian chapel in, in, um, in St. Peter's Basilica. And it's a, it's a very nifty chapel. You know, I've been there several times, uh, given the constraints of, uh, of the ceiling, and, it's pretty nice, actually. Yeah, but it's a, it's a 1950s, 1960s. It's a 20th century job. <laughs> the one in, in St. Peter's? I don't have the date. It's late 50s, I think. 1950s. I, I suspect, yeah. I suspect, yeah. Uh, yeah, I said it's prime real estate. Yes, sir. The uh, St. Casimir's uh, in Lithuania. St. Casimir's Chapel in, in Lithuania. 
After the Tsarist Empire fell, it was first under the Poles, and then under the Lithuanians, and then under the Soviets, and then under you know, present-day independent Lithuania. When was it made the way it is now? And did, at each stage, was there some contribution to the way it looks now? Well, yes, because you had uh, 18th century, you had the dome interior was stuck it over, and then 1730s, 1740s, you had those silver uh, gilt uh, statues that we see installed. So, uh, so uh, that we see now is essentially early 19th century. Um, and the Tsars had sense enough to leave it alone. Now, the Soviets did not, but, uh, but the entire chapel was closed down. Vilnius Cathedral became a museum, and the sarcophagus with his relatives were taken to St. Peter and Paul in Antakalnis, and then it got sent back here. So it survived the 20th century, and it survived in better shape than many Russian churches and chapels under the Soviets. So, yeah, so what I was talking about is what was built up to, up to the point where the dome rises. This is all that we can sort of talk about if we want to go back to what was done as a is what the Council of Trent wanted. So that, that, that is kind of the heart of it. And uh, besides, it's gorgeous. So it's historically accurate that we see yeah. stuff like after World War I, the Polish government added something. No, 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 no. Those, those, those pilasters are authentic. The wall is authentic. Entablature is authentic. The uh, carvings of, of, the, of the cherubs on the capital heads, uh, the same with the eagles. This all goes back to the uh, 16, it was, it was consecrated in 1636. So uh, they date from that, that period, Whew, you know, at least. So that wasn't stripped. The old altar in the front and the main altar is gone and the two side altars are also gone. But then we have the murals came in, you know, like 80 years later or something. Yeah, so it's, it's incremental, but it survives in damn good shape. I mean, the first time I entered that, I said to myself, what the hell is going on? Where is this building from? This is not Vilnius. This is as Roman as can be, and that, that got me started. This was quite a while ago, because it's really very, very unusual. Uh, in, in Vilnius, there's nothing like it. We don't have black marble. <laughs> In Lithuania, we don't have this. But a limited budget. You want black marble? Fine. You want oxblood marble? Yeah, I know you want it bore free. We can't get that. We'll give you some oxblood marble. You know. uh, yes? Uh, just to uh, correct the information that I was given in, in uh, 1967, uh, under the uh, direction of Bishop Brzgis, auxiliary of Kaunas, who was living in Chicago at the time, he initiated the building of the chapel in 1967, therefore okay. it was Paul VI. Paul VI finished And I it. wouldn't be surprised if his good friend, Archbishop Marcinkus, had something to do with uh, that. Yeah, I knew all those guys. Uh, yeah, but I thought John the 20, there's a, it starts with John the 23rd, and then it takes a while to get the permission, on and on and on. Okay, so it's completed with a living memory. I suggest you visit both chapels. Uh, anything else? Well, yes, I think sir. that uh, now that we have the facts checked uh, by our clergy here, uh, and uh, we should probably finish for the evening, but I would like to say something sure. in appreciation for your presentation because it's, my own prejudice always has been that my favorite historians are those who find connections and that I never knew about from Solomon to Casimir, from black acacia wood to black marble. Uh, history is made up of these very fascinating connections and I just would like to express my appreciation for your ability to do that and present us Thank with this you. absolutely you know, fascinating material. The damn thing, everything has baggage. It yes. all has baggage. You know, so yes. if you start tracing it, my God, wow. Yes. <laughs> Historians must open baggage, that's our problem. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.